Craig Greshel, the pastor of Life Church in Oklahoma City, which is probably the third largest church in the United States. Uh, they number 70,000 people. They have a home church, and then they have about 20 satellite churches. Just side point, uh, that's my vision for this church. If God blesses us to the point where we have three full services all the way back, I don't want to sell this place and build a new church. I want to start a satellite church somewhere, you know, where you show the same message in another location in Portland. But anyway, in his book, Soul Detox, he tells... It tells one of the most horrendous stories about bitterness between two families I've ever read. Susie and Jeanette were inseparable. They met with their two husbands uh, and two other couples in a Bible study each week. They did family uh, activities together, took family vacations together. When Jeanette decided she was going to take a part-time job for extra money, Susie said, I'll take care of your uh, infant daughter. Great. It seemed like a win-win situation until her 18-month-old daughter stopped breathing one day. She called 911 in a panic, and fortunately, medical professionals were able to get her breathing again and get her to the hospital. But tests showed that she'd been struck in the back of the head and that it would be likely permanent damage. Well, accusations started to fly. I mean, people, friends, you know, praying for them and asking questions, you know, uh, what happened here? Couldn't be Jeanette wouldn't hurt her daughter. Couldn't be Susie. She couldn't be a suspect. But it got worse when the doctors, uh, you know, again confirmed that uh, she had been struck. And, um, well, then things devolved from bad to worse. Everybody was a suspect. And... Uh, Children's services got involved, and they, uh, since, you know, a little baby had been hurt somehow, they took all the children out of Jeanette and Susie's home. Jeanette was convinced Susie had done it. Susie drew a line in the sand and said, no way. Well, then even neutral people began to take sides, and the bitterness grew. It all came to an end in about two years. The court case was finalized. And that's when Susie shocked everyone. Against her lawyer's counsel, she said, I admit it. I did it. It wasn't, it was an accident. And so the judge sentenced her to 712 days in prison, one for every day she hadn't confessed her crime. The case ended with deep rooted bitterness between the two families. The world's worst prison is not Guantanamo Bay or a federal prison or a state penitentiary. The world's worst prison is not one somebody else puts you in, but one you put yourself in when you refuse to forgive. Like Jeanette, every one of us has been wronged by somebody. So it's easy for us to crawl into the prison of bitterness, anger, and resentment. Someone has wronged you, or your spouse, or your children, or one of your parents. It could be an ex-husband, could be an ex-wife, could be a mother-in-law, a teacher, a coach, a classmate, an employer, a co-worker, a friend, or it could even be a family member. Jesus addresses the prison of unforgiveness in Matthew 20, uh, 18, 21 to 35. So turn to Matthew uh, 18. There are Bibles under every seat. This is the parable of the unforgiving servant. Jesus uses parables because they're fascinating stories that grab people's attention and they stay with people for days after Jesus is done teaching. Let's stand in honor of God's word. Matthew 18, 21 to 35. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. So this is the context 
Peter's question. Now Jesus is going to tell the parable. Is it up on the screen? Okay, read, read it with me. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts. Oh. It's up there now? All right, let's try it again. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold. Did it drop out again? <laughs> okay, well, we'll try. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Lord Jesus, you gave this parable years ago. Be our teacher today. What you meant then and how we should apply it today. We're ready in Jesus' name. Amen. The parable ends with a cryptic one-line explanation. Whenever a parable ends this way, this is the punchline. This is the takeaway. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Obviously, Jesus is teaching that forgiveness is very important. Forgiveness is the key that unlocks many doors. I find at least two. One, forgiveness unlocks the door to treating other people graciously. How do we treat other people graciously? We meet all kinds of people that irritate us. Nice young lady brought home her fiancé to meet her family. And after dinner, the wife said to the husband, get to know the young man. So he said, so, what are your plans? What are you doing for work? And he says, I'm a biblical scholar. Biblical scholar, commendable. And how will you provide a nice home for my daughter as she's accustomed to? I will study and God will provide. And how will you buy her a nice ring as she deserves? I'll study and God will provide. And children, how will you support them? Sir, don't worry. God will provide. This went on and on. Everything the father asked about was the same answer. God will provide. So a little later, the wife said, well, how'd it go? He said, well, he has no job, no plans. But the good news is he thinks I'm God. <clears throat> now, let's look at what the parable says. The parable is brought about by Peter asking, Lord, how many times shall I bring, uh, forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Seven times? In Jewish tradition, you, were to, you are expected to forgive three times. Four, that's, that's, you know, you know, that's too much. So Peter thought he would double it, throw in an extra, and that Jesus would say, good boy, Peter. Instead, Jesus says, no. Not seven times, but 77 times. Uh, in the Greek, it's difficult to tell if Jesus means 77 times or 70 times 7. But the point either way is not that you are to forgive 77 times or 490 times, but you are to forgive always, limitlessly. Therefore, now here comes the parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. 
As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Jesus is a master in his parables of using the preposterous to make his point. So this guy owes 10,000 talents of gold. 10,000 was the highest number used in reckoning in those days. And the talent, or these bags of gold, the talent is uh, the largest unit, uh, currency unit in, in, the, in the Near East at that time. So this guy, uh, I estimate that he owes at minimum a hun hundreds of millions of dollars, and probably he, he, he owes $5.5 billion. The point is, Jesus is saying he owes a preposterous amount. He could never pay it back. Since he was not able to pay the amount, um, the man ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. Jewish law permitted uh, for a man to be sold only if he had uh, committed robbery and the wife was never to be sold. So either Jesus is saying this is a Gentile king and, and deal or it's just another example of preposterous. The thing was so bad, the debt was so great that everybody was going to be sold. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back every, everything. It's, it's just a mere form of words. He can never pay it back. He's just, you know, please. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. The king, mercy far exceeds the man's request. All he requested was more time. The king canceled the whole debt. Now, this is a double-edged parable. In a double-edged parable, you have two stories. And it's always, the emphasis is always on the second story. Here comes the second story. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell on his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. Seizing him by the throat means he wants the money right now or he would throw him in prison. The insanity of the situation cannot be more graphic. This guy has been forgiven hundreds of millions of dollars or 5.5 billion by my guess. Can't possibly pay it. And then he goes out and meets a, another man who owes him a few hundred dollars. At most, it would be, it's 100 silver coins, it would be 100 days wages, figuring just $10 an hour, $80 a day, it would be $8,000 is the maximum this guy owes. Been forgiven all this millions or billions, he can't forgive a few hundred dollars or a few thousand. It's crazy. We're surprised. Now, in a parable, it's always at the point of surprise that Jesus makes his point. Why would this guy go out and not forgive a guy who just owed him a little bit? When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. When the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he shall pay back all he owed. Then it ends with a pungent one-line explanation. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Forgiveness from the heart is contrasted with forgiveness from the lips. It's easier to say, I forgive you, than to really forgive. The key that unlocks the door to treating other people graciously is remembering how much God has forgiven us. Apostle Paul says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Boy, if you want a verse to memorize, that would be on the list. God's forgiveness of us is the basis for us forgiving other people. The servant was forgiven millions or billions. By the way, I'm trying to uh, uh, construct the amount in today's terms. You with me? Certainly, he could forgive a few hundred dollars or a few thousand. Can I forgive others? Of course. When I remember how much God has forgiven me, things I've said, things I've thought, things I've done, I can forgive others. 
Daniel is big. He's a bodybuilder. His trophy chest is filled with uh, trophies of him winning weightlifting contests and uh, pictures of you know, him in a, some pose. He's trained scores of people. His dream, he lives in uh, Porta Alegro, and his dream is to have a gym of his own. And he went to the bank to ask about it, and they said, yeah, we could give you a loan to start your own business, uh, but you need someone to co-sign. So his brother agreed to co-sign. So they filled out the application, the paperwork, and everything was going along fine, and the bank called and said, uh, Daniel, your check's ready. So after he got done with work, he went to pick up his check, and the banker said, why are you here? Well, to pick up my check. Oh, that's funny. Your brother picked it up a little earlier. He used it to pay off his mortgage. Well, Daniel was incensed. How could his brother trick him like that? He stomped over to his brother's house and pounded on the door. And his brother opened the door with his daughter in his arms. He figured Daniel wouldn't clock him with it. And he was right. But Daniel said, if I ever see you again, I'll choke you to death. Break your neck. So they didn't see each other. Well, Daniel met a pastor, Christian, Alex Dutton, who led Daniel and his wife to Christ. They became devoted followers of Christ. But even though he had received so much forgiveness from God, he still couldn't forgive his brother. The pot of revenge still simmered. He couldn't stand the thought of seeing his brother's face. And his brother loved his face too much to let it be seen by Daniel. But they both lived in the same town. They knew inevitably they are going to bump into each other. And they didn't know what would happen when it did. Well, it happened one day there in the downtown. Daniel saw his brother. Brother didn't see him. Immediately his fists clenched up. He felt his face get hot. Then he looked at his brother again and he saw the face of his father in his brother. And when he saw that, it just kind of melted his heart and his brother became his brother again. So he came up behind uh, his brother and then Daniel, or his brother saw him and started to run, but he was too slow. He grabbed him, Daniel grabbed him by the shoulder. The brother winced, he didn't know what to expect, but instead of his Daniel choking him to death, he gave him a big bear hug. And the two of them hugged in a river of people and wept. Remember what Daniel said again. When I saw my father's face on my brother, he became my brother again. Next time you see somebody who's hurt you, who stabbed you in the back, See the face of the one who forgave you so much. See your father's, the one who gave you mercy when no one else would. See his face on the face of the one who double-crossed you. Then healing can, forget, can begin and bitterness can go. There's a second door forgiveness unlocks. Forgiveness unlocks the door to God's forgiveness. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Jesus says God won't forgive you if you do not forgive those who have hurt you. That's the same thing we heard last week. Let's look at the verses we saw last week. Some of you were not here. For if you forgive, why don't you read this with me? For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. You say, wait a minute, I've got to forgive before God will forgive me? That sounds like works. Climbing the ladder to get into heaven. No. The unmerciful servant couldn't forgive a few hundred dollars obviously shows that he didn't appreciate how much he was forgiven. He wasn't truly sor sorry for stealing from the king. He just didn't want to go to jail. 
when we're truly sorry for our sins and realize how much we've been forgiven by God, we will forgive others. When we don't forgive others, it calls into question if we've really asked God to forgive us, if we really recognize how much he's forgiven us. He can't forgive us because we haven't asked. We're not sorry for our sins. We all have so much for which we need to be forgiven. Cornelius Anderson was convicted of robbery in 2000. The judge said, uh, go home and wait your next instructions. But instructions never came. He got married. They had three kids. He got into the carpentry trade, paid his taxes, totally turned around his life. In 2013, the police realized their mistake and they sent a SWAT car uh, to pick him up. Now he's serving his sentence in the Missouri prison. Like Cornelius, we all have sins for which we need to pay. God offers us full forgiveness through Christ's death on the cross for us. The evidence that we've received his forgiveness is how well we forgive those who have sinned against us. In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Jesus says, if you do not forgive others, then God will turn you over to the imprisonment of an unforgiving spirit. You will be shackled with bitterness. Jesus is not saying, if you don't forgive, then the deal is off and I'm going to send you to hell. He's saying that people who don't forgive are shackled by bitterness and tend to be sick. Who knows how many illnesses people suffer from today because they're suffering from bitterness and resentment. Forgiveness is the key that unlocks many doors. It unlocks the door to treating other people graciously. And it unlocks the door to God's forgiveness. So how do you know if you've forgiven someone? I don't know for sure, but I jotted down five tests I think you could take. One is the I'm not waiting for them to repent test. If you're waiting for somebody who hurts you to come to you to ask forgiveness before you'll forgive, you'll be waiting a long time. Odds are good they don't even know they hurt you. They've moved on. They've forgotten all about it. You could, you could connect them to a lie detector test. They'd probably pass with flying colors. You totally forgive them whether or not they ever ask for it. Two, the first thought test. When the first thought you have about the person is not the injury they did to you. The first thought you have a person is positive or remotely good, you've probably extended them forgiveness. Three, the revenge test. Do you still think of getting even? Is that what you would call forgiveness? Four, the you do not tell anybody what they did to you test. If you're telling people what that, have you heard, do you know what she did to me? When you do that, you're punishing them. So just drop the story if you've forgiven them. And then five, I think this is the most important one. The accept forgiveness is a life sentence test. I told you last week I had a come to Jesus moment a couple weeks ago. It's, I read the verse, if you do not forgive other people who've sinned against you, then your father will not forgive you. And I thought, oh my goodness, I think there's some people I haven't forgiven. And so I spent some time with Christ and just named them one by one. But there's no, I'm under no illusion that that one moment was a one and done experience. You have to continue to forgive them. When the thoughts come back, you've got to forgive again. It's a lifetime deal. As hard as it is to grant other people forgiveness, it really is the way to go. Remember Jeanette and Susie? Susie served her time. When she got out of prison, she and her husband came to visit Jeanette and her, her husband. And Susie got down on her knees and says, Would you please forgive me for what I did? I'm so sorry. And they, 
They graciously forgave her. Their daughter's now four. She's cute as can be, but she'll always have a limp and always have a speech problem because of that injury. Then Jeanette said to her, do you want to want to hold the baby? I'm not a baby anymore. As Susie held the baby, there wasn't a dry eye in the room. Bitterness left, healing came. And no one who knows their story can stay the same. God wants you and me to forgive in the same way. Is there someone you need to forgive? I want to end this message the same way I did last week. Some of you weren't here. Others of you, if you forgave someone last week, maybe you do it again. It's, it's not one and out. So I'd like you to all bow your heads. If there's someone you need to forgive, would you just say, Jesus, would you help me to forgive? And then you say their name. Maybe it's a list. Uh, let me, you can lift your eyes again. I just, I went home and I was talking with Jory after last week and she was telling about who she forgave. And um, then I realized I was angry with the doctor. I, I went into the hospital like three weeks ago and I think the poor care I received has resulted in me having kind of lingering illness the last three weeks. And uh, so I had to forgive again. Another, the list keeps growing. You, you don't run out of people. So heads bowed. Um, and ask God if you, if you need some help. He'll bring to mind some people that maybe you haven't even thought of that you need to forgive. So ask him to help you to forgive and then list their names. Lord Jesus, thank you that you have forgiven us so much. If we've asked you and invited your son into our lives, you've forgiven us a ton. Help us in the same way forgive other people who have sinned against us. In Jesus' name.